I, I don't know if you can hear me, but it's not safe outside. Whatever you do, don't go outside. Stay indoors. They'll get you if you go outside. Well, hello and, and welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. My name is Ray, and today I'll be reviewing some current and classic apocalypse audiobooks for you. Now, as my friend George Fisher once told me, I have a face for radio, a voice for silent films, and the mentality of a five-year-old that goes along with the personality of Life Boy Soap. So, you, you know, I hope I can kind of entertain you for a little bit here. Uh, I might be paraphrasing what he just said, but you kind of get a pretty good picture of what I'm talking about, okay? Um, but today, oh, today, oh, I just want to let you know where I'm at right now. I'm currently locked down in my underground bunker. I have a lot of food and water stashed over this way. Um, I have guns and ammunition out the yin yang over here. Man, my yin yang hurts after taking those out of there. Um, but I am locked and loaded. I am locked down. I am rough and ready for this apocalypse. There are sirens going off. There are people screaming. The news is crazy. Uh, and all I know is, is there's something weird going on outside. And I am staying indoors for this. So, get ready. Because now, we are doing the apocalypse. <laughs> All right, so for my first time back doing an apocalypse show, because this is only my second show since I've been back, episode 41, I thought I'd make this special, make it big, make it bold, make it blast you in the face. Um, I am doing the lit RPG book, Life in the North, an apocalyptic lit RPG by Dao Wong, narrated by Nick Padell. The series is called System Apocalypse, so this is book one, with a book length of a total of nine hours and 51 minutes. Greetings, citizen. As a peaceful and organized immersion into the Galactic Council has been declined, extensively and painfully, we might add, your world has been declared a dungeon world. Thank you. We were getting bored with the 12 that we had previously. Please note that the process of developing a dungeon world can be difficult for current inhabitants. We recommend leaving the planet till the process is completed in 373 days, 2 hours, 14 minutes, and 12 seconds. For those of you unable or unwilling to leave, do note that new dungeons and wandering monsters will spawn intermittently throughout the integration process. All new dungeons and zones will receive recommended minimum levels, however, during the transition period, expect there to be significant volatility in the levels and types of monsters in each dungeon and zone. As a new dungeon world, your planet has been designated a free immigration location. Undeveloped worlds in the Galactic Council may take advantage of this new immigration policy. So, in my life, I generally have no regrets, no regrets whatsoever. Um, but this book makes me actually regret a lot of things. Um, first of all, I'm going to just totally come clean and say that I have alluded in the past um, to there being this author out there that I just would not do any of their books because uh, I had listened to one or two of their books uh, and their writing style was really hard for me to get into. Uh, it was present tense, first person, and I have, a, I, 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 I struggle, struggle to get through those kind of books. I just don't like present tense anything. Uh, and, and it was just kind of a, a, a rough time for me. I, I, I just said, you know what? Um, this might be great for other people, but for me, it's not worth it because I'm going to hurt somebody's business, their livelihood, um, by giving a horrible review because it's written in this way that I don't like it. And I don't like to do that. I try not to be judgmental of things that, I, that bother me. Uh, you know, for example, let's just say, I, let's just say, for example, I don't like sex scenes in a book. Um, I could skip those or I could not read the book. And I don't prefer, I prefer not to skip sections of a book. I think it's unfair for me to give a review by jumping things. Um, and granted, you're not missing a lot if you're jumping a sex scene, but I try to always listen 100% to 
a book uh, all the time. And in fact, if I don't hear something, I'll back it up until I know where I left off at. You know, if I'm taking the dog out for a walk and the traffic gets too loud or something like that, um, I try to go back so I don't miss anything. I want to be able to say that I literally have listened to every single sec- second of this series from start to finish so that I'm on par with the author, knowing that I and the narrator and the author have been through every single word in the series. I think it's fair for me to do that. It's unfair for me to not to. So it's really unfair for me to judge something because I don't like it. Like if I don't like, um, you know, uh, let's just say I'm not a big fan of action movies. And I'm like, man, I get so tired of John McClane crawling through these air ducts that just wouldn't be possible. You know, they're too small nowadays and just so on and so forth. Um, I have to suspend my disbelief. So if I have a, a personal grievance with something or something I don't like, I, I just either just avoid it completely or, you know, well, I guess that's the best way to do it. Uh, Cause if I, if I do it, then I'm going to have to say, well, I'm giving this book a bad grade because this didn't work for me. And I, and there's probably a book later on in this show. In fact, where <sighs> the writing was great. The story was great. But they broke a rule that I really don't think should be broken. And I'll talk a bit more about this. But anyway, I'm sure that whenever I talked about this person, you all thought that I was talking about another well-known little RPG author um, who I'm not going to name. Um, but they're very controversial. And I don't, don't do reviews on them because of the controversy itself. Um, I try to stay very neutral on these sort of things and, and just stay out of the way. So um, I skipped Dao Wong's book just because I had a bad experience with one or two of his other novels. I'm not going to say what those are, okay? Um, but for that reason, I, I just I stayed away. Um, and I, I think in my case, um, I was really wrong. Um, the, the first book I read of Dow's was, was a first-person present tense, and the narrator did not bring the book to life at all. Not, not like he should have. Not like Nick Podell does here. Seriously, uh, the book was like having Mozart, the writings of Mozart being played by first graders. Uh, that's the best way I can ex- explain it. Um, because there was r- really good material there, but it just couldn't be conveyed through the medium the way it should have been. It just, there was just a loss of, of intellectual quanti- quantities that just did not make it where it should have due to the narration. Um, whereas this book, and I guess the best way I could do it, I'm not really hip on current music people. Um, I, I, I would probably say something like, you know, Stevie Nicks, the goddess, but I'm not going to do that because most people don't like Stevie. They don't, they don't know who she is or they're a big Fleetwood Max fans, but I know there's one person and I was going through like, should be Adele or Celine Dion. Um, but Beyonce being produced by Mozart, you know, Mozart's back behind the scenes and he's cranking the tunes and adjusting things. So that you have like this powerhouse of genius and talent, uh, coming out. Uh, so it makes a complete difference. Um, the first book that I read just did not come to any of these criteria at all. Uh, it, it was, it was great writing, I'm sure, but the writing was lost due to the narration. Here, the writing, even though it's kind of written in the style I, I don't care for, and I've done this with other people, like Annalise Rennie with Future's Orphans, um, first person, Present tense. I, I I said I'll overlook this, so I do. I overlook these things. Um, so I did that here, and, and I said I'll just bite the bullet. I I needed to get an apocalypse book, and I said Dao Wong is probably the most well known apocalyptic person out there, uh, aside from Daniel Shin often, um, who has Apocalypse Gates. So you know, pound for pound, I could not do an apocalypse episode without including Dao Wong. So. Since the narration was such a, a big factor for me, I'm going to kind of talk about Podell first, if that's okay. Um, he brings this story to life. He is animated, emotional, and builds suspense and a sense of danger like nobody's business. I often, I know I often list Podell, um, amongst some of the best narrators out there. If you ask me who, who's there, I'll say, oh, there's Luke Daniels and so on and so forth. But, but, because I recognize the talents. Okay, I really do. Um, but for me, he's always been like the low guy out of the big five. Like I'd go a couple other people first and he'd be number five on my list. And if I was doing it out of seven, he'd probably be number seven um, because he's good, but he's never really struck me as being amazing. Um, and I'm not saying he's not great because he's probably one of the top tier narrators out there. And I think he is good. But 
to me, heavyweights are like, you know, Daniels, Parsno, Hayes. You know, I mean, I could go on with a list of people, but, um, you know, Oliver Wyman, uh, Bronson Pinchot, those people are like a massive, skilled narration people. And Podell's kind of like in there, but he, he doesn't qual- qualify for being right in that, that, that league right in that area. But he, here, man, oh man, I mean, there's, there's never been a book of his I didn't enjoy, but I, I don't know. He just seemed to really kind of go crazy here, and he just adds so much that made me fall in love with the words and the characters, uh, and that's hard. That's hard for a first-person, present-tense kind of book or speaking, uh, and, and the, I'm just saying you know, the writing here was amazing, but more importantly, Podell did something that he made me realize just how good Wong is, and especially like when he has a good uh, way to convey his words. Um, Wong starts the book the right way, and I didn't do that as a play on words. I just realized that I just said what I said. Um, he goes for the jugular. He, he shows no mercy whatsoever. Um, he gets right into the apocalypse, just like you should. Uh, you know, I, I don't need 30 pages or six chapters of build up about how life is going to be so hard for these people. Get into it and get it started. And he does that. He does that right away. That's the way you do it. That's the best thing I can say is get into the story and get into it quick. Don't dawdle about. And he doesn't. He gets into this and man, uh, you know, um, I couldn't ask for more. I mean, he gets right to the apocalypse, making Earth a, a sort of gaming getaway for aliens, like a, a dungeon world. Now, John, the MC, the main character, wakes up in one of the highest rated danger zones that you could possibly find on Earth. And because of it, he gets a lot of perks. Like, he's got all these things they can use these things, uh, you know, new skills and powers with um, if he survives. But he's in this really nasty place that's like, let, let's just say, for example, it's level 80 and he's level zero. Um, so he knows that if he doesn't get the hell out quick, he's a dead man. So he does his stuff and he gets out. But He slowly makes his way back home and pulls off some pretty impressive feats along the way, uh, just due to quick thinking, and so that by the time he does make it back to civilization, he's earned a pretty good number of titles and a rep, uh, even though he's not as powerful as he should be compared to other people, because there's other people who've survived as well, and they've been out grinding and doing things like, you know, you what if you were in a video game and you're, you're now in this, this hostile world, but you have to go out and kill monsters to eat. Um, so they're, they're, you know, these other people have leveled up, but he's got the rep and the titles that they don't have, and he's done it at a really low level. So it's kind of impressive. Um, now this is the book. This is the book in a nutshell. Interesting, interesting main character. Fantastic world building. Great gaming sections as he builds his stats. Um, he levels, he gains his class. I mean, the book will kind of feel familiar to you. It can't, you can't help it. I mean, this is a little RPG. It will feel very familiar and yet be amazingly new at the same time as you go through it and you read it. Um, I loved every second, um, that I was listening to this book. I was, completely engaged the entire time. And I don't think there was a slow section in it. Uh, I, I love apocalypses. I mean, hell, hell's bells. Uh, I myself have, am writing an apocalypse book. Uh, I just wish I had time to crank out a few thousand words to submit to Wong's call for short stories for his possible anthology in this series, because this is an incredible opportunity and I have such a good idea and I don't have time to do it. I really don't. But I, if I had, t- just enough time to do 20,000 words, man, I would put this out there. This is a series um, that if you like the series uh, and you like to write, this is a series that you want to get in on because deadline is the end of June and we're like, what, talking 18th? So you got like 12 days to get something written and submitted. And I usually do all my writing at the last possible second, but I don't have time to do this sort of stuff right now. Uh, So I'm really regretting it. Um, but anyway, uh, the story itself is amazing. I can't wait to see what happens next. There's a slew of books after this. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest again. The only reason why I got this book was because I wanted to do the Apocalypse show. And, and I completely regret not getting this book sooner. I really do. Um, I was a complete idiot. Okay. Just so Dow, forgive me. Um, the book is intense. It's tender. It's full of action. It's got plotting, politics, monsters, mutants, mayhem, and more. And more. I could go, you know, and get material 
Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You, you, the material's there. You could get this material and write a short story and do this. So just one of those things. You got time, get it cranked out and get it done and, and submit. So, man, I, I'm just going to plug in one last time with this. Um, I couldn't ask more from this book. And again, I do extend a deep apology to Tao Wong for taking so long to get to his material and acknowledging how amazing, how amazing his, his work actually is. Uh, my final score is 8.6 stars. I mean, it's just that good. It's, it's really intense for first book. It's, it's, it's stewed to perfection. Okay. So next up is Gearing Up Apocalypse Gates Author's Cut Book Three by Daniel Shinoffen. Um, Narrated by Tess Irondale. This is a part of the series, Apocalypse Gates. Uh, this is the author's cut, so book three in that series, with a book length of 11 hours and 36 minutes. Alvin was dressed and about to leave the room when he was stopped by Jarvis. Sir, there's been a change to the button that returns you to your base. Alvin and Becky exchanged a look. Explain, Jarvis, Alvin said into the silence. Yes, sir. Rather than needing to be inside a secure room, as before, now that button will transform the nearest doorway into a portal. It is visible to and usable by only yourself and those in your party. It remains where it was initiated while you are in your home base, but upon your exit it ejects everyone within, at least at present. The portal may be summoned once per day, resetting each sunrise. You are still bound by the rule to spend at least eight hours each day in the game. Why do you call it my base and not my room anymore? Alvin asked. If you glance at your character sheet, sir, you will notice that the upgrade to take Miss to your room has also been changed. Okay, cats and kitties, confession time. Okay, you listen, pretty babies. Um, I have to admit... I've been really hard on poor Daniel Shinoffen, um, with this series. Um, you know, this series was one of the earlier books I'd reviewed. Uh, and I think I had just kind of gotten into the, the, the reviewing pool, so to speak. I just started dipping my toes and, uh, you know, I had no lifeguard to pull me out of the deep water. Um, to be fair about it, everything I said was the way I felt about it. I still agree with everything that I said. I, I didn't say anything that I disagree with now. I s simply, Maybe came out a little bit harder than I should have on a couple of topics. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that I've kind of foregone some of the issues that I had in the earlier books. And, and I'll get to that. Um, I have enjoyed his Apocalypse books so far. But my biggest complaints, if you want to go back and look at the other ep uh, episodes where I talk about them, were that it was more of a slice of life book, um, which I really hated at the time. And I'm only just now kind of switching gears, you know, into getting into that sort of stuff. Um, and there was, a, there was a lot of changing of the gameplay. And that still happens here in this third book. There's still, uh, there's, there's still changes in the game itself. And, you know, as much as I, I disagree with it, I mean, it's, it's Shinofen's, story and it, it's his game and if that's how they want to do things i just have to roll with it um and i, I think that that's fine I, I think that you know he, he's got a plan there's reasons why he makes changes uh so I, I just have to trust that he knows what he's doing and where he's going with it and it's not just being made just to kind of throw you know things into another gear so to speak or to change lanes just because you know i think he's He's got to wait place he's going to, so I'm going to trust that he's leading us in a direction that's going to go well. Um, so like I say, I've kind of flipped on the slice of life stuff a little bit, but I'm still trying a little bit harder than, than I should to, to adjust to the gaming changes. The, the, the game adjustments just, they kind of throw me for a loop every time that happens. But again, it's, it's his thing. Now this book is being judged on its own merits, 100%. Uh, now, I do have a disclaimer. Um, the narrator for this series, the original first two books, Andrea Parsno, voluntarily left due to some of the more graphic content that is in this book. And I hope I'm not spilling the beans or anything, but she just couldn't handle some of the things that happened. And to me, honestly, I, I don't know. I guess I'm desensitized to a lot of stuff. I don't find anything in it that's so disturbing or so graphic. Um 
to me, but to other people, again, I know that she's not the first person to say this. Um, there's other authors, not other authors, other narrators I know who have backed away from books just because of the sex heavy content or other things. So, you know, um, don't hold anything against Daniel um, because Mr. Shinovan had nothing to do with this. It was completely a mutual, I, I want to go, okay, you're good to go. Um, I'm not holding anything against you kind of deals. Um, and I think Tess comes in and she does a really good job, but I'm going to just, you know, go with it. But there was no rift. She didn't get the boot. Um, and he has the right to pen whatever he likes. I just want to point that out. And Andrea has the rights to avoid things that she doesn't like, um, you know, that she doesn't feel in her where wheelhouse, so to speak. So as much as I, I hate it when a series switches narrators, I'm not going to penalize this book at all, at all, um, since this is kind of a no-fault situation. Uh, it's not a divorce, but the two could continue on together later on. Um, so let me just note that I need to talk about Tess Irondale for a second, since I'm on that topic. I mean, Tess does a really good job of stepping into Andrea's ruby slippers. And I mean that because yeah, I'm not going to say her shoes. Andrea Parsonow has got some ruby slippers. Okay, let's just be honest about it. Honestly, I think she keeps the tone of the first two books um, carried over so that you're not scratching your head saying, you know, this feels totally different. I, I think tonally, it's it's very similar. It's a bit almost identical. Um, so she does a really good job there. But she still gives the book um, her own style um, while trying to keep the feel original. And that's not easy to do. That's that's a hell of a tightrope walk. But Tess pulls it off. It's a tough job. Um, but, but she comes out batting. She's swinging and she's batting like about 400. Um, it's not as perfect as, as Andrea would have it. Um, but I'm biased with Andrea. I think Andrea is amazing. And not that I'm saying Tess isn't, but, um, you know, taking over for, um, somebody in this case, uh, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, so I give her a lot of credit coming into this and, you know, um, stepping up to the plate and taking the challenge, um, when you know it's it, you know you're you're coming in after a giant, so giving her that um, kudos that she deserves that 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 award of saying yep you did this is is perfect because she does a really good really good job. So sorry I had to had to do something there. I was just flipping my mind around. Um. Anyway, um. Now, as far as the story goes, this is one of those books um, that I, I could have put in my naughty episode. If you want me to be frank about it, uh, this actually feels more like it's made for the naughty episode than it does for the apocalypse episode. Um, and again, I'm not faulting Daniel for this. It's just his writing style, and, and we had a lot of a lot of sex in the first two books. This time around, I, I think it, it's the sex is really getting into uh, a whole new level um, because it's just like uh, we'll go out and full fight and then we'll sex, 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 fight um, and so on and so forth. Um, it's chock full of sex. Let me just put it that way. Um, so if you are not into naughtiness, skip the book because you're going to, If you, I'll put it like this. If you think you can skip the naughty parts and enjoy the book, you're going to skip a lot of stuff, and there's not going to be a lot of book left otherwise. And again, that's just the way this, the story works. Um, Alvin and Gothy, um, you know, Gothy is a great character. I love Gothy a lot. She's probably one of my favorite characters that I've ever read. Um, not to say that Alvin isn't cool, but Gothy is just, there's something about Gothy that if you read her, um, she just appeals to you so much so quickly, uh, and there's a connection. And I, I don't know if the, I'm the only person like that, but I just really, I just think that this this hits really fast, really hard with her. And so, um, you know, you, you have a connection, but if you, you skip the sex parts, there's not, not a lot left over. So it's also got some B&D and m um, bits and pieces. So before I go any further, before I go any further, I just want to say that my safe word is moist. Got it? Moist. Now, again, there are changes, um, you know, to the gaming system um, with the addition of, I guess they're called runes. 
uh, that, that you can put onto things, which will allow upgrades. So it's nice. Um, the story itself doesn't really do much progression story wise. But again, I'm going to reiterate this. In the first two books, you don't get a lot of progression story wise. It's kind of like, and I know I accused him of treading his, you know, spinning his wheels. He's just treading water. Um, and it was a slice of life book. Um, but that's just what this series is. You just kind of have to come into it and say, um, this book is going to be about mostly Alvin and, and Gothy's um, relationship. The, there's there's things they're going to deal with that's not going to go well. And um, once you do that, um, you, you will see you will see very quickly uh, that the, the, the story is pretty good. But you, you kind of have to know um, what you're getting before you go into it, because it's it's not going to be easy to get through otherwise. Um, like I say, you're going to feel like you're skipping all over the place and going nowhere fast. Um, but that's just the, the style of this book. There There is not meant to be um, a story progression like we go from here to here to here. There's no bad guy. There's no overarching evil. Um, but, but... Um, we do get um, some other characters, some other player characters popping up. So that's new. Um, and again, I'm no prude, but for people who are, and I just want to just point this out for people who I, I do, this is, a, this is something that bugs me um, for people who are surviving in apocalypse. Um, and death is lurking around every single corner. It seems like they're pounding each other more than they're pounding on monsters, uh, other players or NPCs. So, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not a prude, but I just want to say there's, there's just way too much sex compared to the other things that, that are actually happening out there. And, and I have to say, and I know I've said this before, Alvin and Gothi's relationship is probably, um, the best relationship that I've read in a long time. I mean, it's a very healthy, uh, well, I'll say it, it was, a, it was a really healthy, um, relationship, um, up until a certain point. Now here things happen, um, that kind of change things up a little bit because there's another person added into the mix. Uh, and that, that sort of, changes up gears a little bit. Um, but again, that's just, just the way it is. Um, so, you know, you need to just kind of realize that is one of the things, but honestly, there is so much sex out there. Um, that you have to ask if Alvin is taking like intravenous shots of Viagra and Gothi has to, has to be sore. The Nancy Kerrigan after she get laid out by that guy with his huge, huge pipe. Um, you know, if you, if you got that, then, you know, you get it. But she got laid out by a pipe and I know it couldn't have been fun and easy. So, you know, I don't know what else to say. Um, that's it. That's all I can go into, but there's a lot of sex. This could have been in my, my upcoming naughty show. Now, overall, the book is well-written, has great characterizations, cool concepts, um, but I, I think it seems to be transitioning from a hardcore action-adventure book into a Cinemax sci-fi film. And I, and I just to be frank with you, that's just the way it, and that's fine. That's fine because the writing's top-notch, and you just you have to love Alvin and Gothi's relationship. But I would like some sort of warning or notification if it's going in that direction, um, because, you know, I, I just want to know what I'm picking up and why I'm getting it. Uh, and, and here I'm going to say the final score for this is um, 7.8 stars. Um, and here's why. Um, Tess does a great job. Gothi is is just the greatest. But I just feel like the story took a backseat to the sex, which is ironic because that's where most sex happens, in the backseat. Um, but that's that's just about, the, about it. I would have gone higher with a few more points. Um, but the the... If you really trimmed out all the sex, there there would be a lot less of a book. And I need a little bit more story. And I need a little bit more meat in my sandwich. I don't know if I said that right. Um, 
in order for me to say, hey, you know, that's it. If this was plugged as being like a harem book uh, and there's nothing but sex in it, it's all I was expecting, no problem. But I'm expecting an apocalypse book with doom and gloom and death. And you, you do get that, but not quite as much as you do the other stuff. So 7.8 stars. Next up is an awesome, awesome book, Survivors Dark Elf Chronicles Book 2 by Dave Wilmarth, narrated by Justin Thomas James and Lori Catherine Winkle, and including Jeff Hayes, J.H. Um, book length of 12 hours and 43 minutes. When they eventually logged out that evening, Mace and Sherry met up in the dining room of the underground complex they called home. Together, they cooked pasta, adding in chipped beef from a can. Sherry also opened a can of peaches for dessert. All through the preparation, the two accidentally bumped into each other or found a reason to reach across the other to retrieve something. Their newly physical relationship had them behaving like newlyweds, and when it came time to sit and eat, Mace felt a bit lonely having her all the way across the table. During cleanup, the two did the dishes practically joined at the hip. They were just putting away the last of the pots when Peabody's voice echoed through the kitchen. Mace, Admin Sherry, I am detecting movement in the same quadrant as previously. The building across the park. The AI reported in his monotone voice. Mace gripped Sherry's arm tightly as they made for the door. Same building where Sherry killed the last creature, Peabody? It began in that location, Mace. The target has now moved in the direction of this building. I told Dave Wilmorth uh, a while back, if he put a rock spider somewhere in this book, I would sing him a song. So I'm going to do that now. Dave Wilmorth, this one's for you, bud. Boom, 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 boom. I can't, can't play music because there's, there's, there's a, what do you call that stuff? There's, there's regulations, and if I play music, then I can get fined and I have to pay royalty fees and all that stuff. So I can't do that. So i got to pretend like I'm playing music, so... We were in a cave. Ooh, Everybody there was a drow. Then I felt like I was being stalked. That's when I saw the rock. Ooh, but it wasn't a rock. It was a rock spider. Bum, 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 rock spider. Oh, sorry. See, I get a little too out of control. And everything just goes to hell. But this is the apocalypse. I'm allowed to sing, pretty babies. I'm allowed to do whatever I want. I'm in my bunker. I'm safe and sound. If I want to sing, I will sing. So, eh, you kind of get the idea, though, right? You kind of get where I'm going. You know what I'm cooking. So, I've been waiting for this book for some time. I don't know how to say it um, any other way. I really, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and I was not disappointed. Um, I wanted to get this book as soon as it came out, and it was right when I had just spent every single credit that I had. So I had to wait till new credits came, and I was, I was literally losing my mind. I was like, I, I got to get this. I got to do this. Um, and, and I, I did get it. So I, I then waited to do the show. Um, but I have to say, Will Marth is an intense and yet introspective writer. You know, I mean, he comes up with some amazing stuff, but still makes you feel like you need to ponder things long after you finish one of his stories. I mean, there is this character that I believe is named Evan, and forgive me, I listen to a lot of stuff, and so if I don't take a note, which I don't take notes because I listen to it in the car or when I'm embalming or whatever, so I don't always have time to remember every single thing, but I'm pretty sure his name is Evan. Evan is a dick. Um, you know, his person personality and his portrayal make you make you just wish horrible things upon him even though he does like really nothing actually wrong 90 percent of the time he's in the book um well he does but you find out some of the stuff afterwards but like to the people that are there you know the main characters um he he really doesn't do anything wrong to griff um or you know anybody else uh, so um you're, you're, what you're seeing is just you're reacting to the way he's behaving. Um, and that just shows you how good of a Raider Wilmarth is because you just really want something horrible to occur to Evan from the minute he comes into your life to the minute he is no longer there. Um, and that could be when the book ends. But um, that's just how good 
the writing is because you just want to shake this man. You want to shake him and throw him outside for the zombies. Um, now, you know, you have to ask yourself as you're going through this, this is one of those little pottery things, does my anger and frustration for this man come from somewhere else? Uh, you know, because, you know, I, I know that I wanted to kill this guy. I wanted him dead. And, and to want a character to die just because they're a bit of a D-bag isn't really great. Not really great. I mean, if you think about it, if you wished every D-bag in the world to just drop over dead and other people did the same thing, you're probably going to get clocked and lumped in to that one of that categories that people are wishing you dead. I mean, everybody has other people they hate. No one is universally loved. Uh, so, you know, you're going to get it just because somebody out there doesn't like you for something you did or you don't do or you think you might have done. It doesn't matter. Um, but there's a lot of thinky stuff here. Thinky, thinky, thinky. Um, and, and so, yeah, we do get, like, you know, more for our buck than what we normally do in a little RPG, because you do do a lot of thinking here um, as as we go. Now, we do get more characters, um, and, and damn, Wilmarth, damn Wilmarth. I, I, I like that. Dave Wilmarth should become damn Wilmarth. Yeah, Wilmarth, you're now damn Wilmarth. And, you know, I, I think that uh, that's a good name, damn Wilmarth. You know, he goes on and he does something really horrible. He pulls a, a where the red fern grows or, you know, old yeller moment on me. It makes me want to just give him, him, a swift kick in the south of the border. Um, and there are reasons why I don't watch movies like that. So anyway, we pick up, we pick up with Mace and his lady trying desperately to make the best of a bad situation. And they're actually doing pretty darn well. They locate another survivor, and then it kind of steamrolls into more people being out there than they realized. And even though they don't get to have face-to-face -face contact with many of them, they at least know there's about 18 other people out there, if you give or take the, the, the ones that they know about compared to the ones that they, they have, have been told about. Um, I will reiterate that I don't know which parts of the book I like more, the real world, real world exploits or the in-game adventures? It's impossible to call. Generally, most lit RPG books provide you with a cursory glance at what's happening in the outside world, and then they get you into the game, and, you know, the outside stuff never comes up again, you know. Um, and that's not the case uh, at all. I, I think that um, this is one of those things where... Um, you, you can't tell which is better. And, and that's great because both things are good. Like the in-game stuff is good and, and the real world stuff is good. And all I know is, is that when I was in the real world, I looked forward to the game. And when I was in the game, I wanted to know what was happening IRL. And it was a vicious cycle and it was unrelenting. And that's just how Will Marth does his job. He just drags you along because he can. And, and you, you just long for the other thing. It's that grass is always greener or this is always better. This is one of those things that he pulls this off spectacularly because it, it, this is like a razor wire. You know, one misstep and you're getting sliced to ribbons. And he he really does this just so that you, you say, okay, um, I like this part and I like this part. And uh, for me, I like both of the parts. But no matter where I was in the book, I wanted to be somewhere else because the other stuff was was hanging over and you had to know what was happening there. But then when you were in this, other, you know, when you left that, then you were like, well, that was happening over there. I need to know this. So, I mean, he just does a great job. He just does a great job with this. And the most compelling and emotionally charged bits came during the part that I will not speak up. Um, look right and see what I'm talking about. Read this book. Watch this movie. Um, so, you know, I don't want to spoil anything. So if you don't recognize my references, don't look them up until after you listen to the book. Also, um, Dave Wilmarth kind of gives out nods, which I appreciate this a lot, um, when an author gives out nods to people. So like you get nods to Daniel Shinofen and Mountain Dale's master, Daniel Kraut. Um, Daniel Kraut? <laughs> you can tell I'm getting tired. It's 1230 a.m. Haven't slept. Um, and I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, but because it's the end of the world, I don't have to go to work tomorrow. So great. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, Mountain Dale's master crowd. Um, Dave Wilmarth 
knows how to put the shout outs in his books. Um, it's, it's just right out there in the open and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, the, my problem is, is like narrators never get mentioned though. All you writers out there, keep that in mind the next time you set to writing, because even I, a lowly peon like myself, um, mentioned Annalise Rennie and Andrea Parsno in a short story that I did recently in anthologies out there because narrators are the bomb. Now, speaking of narrators, SBT's Bonnie and Clyde, and that would be JTJ, uh, the man with three first names, Justin Thomas James, and Lori Catherine Winkle's performances, they'll just kill you. Um, there is some sincere, heartbreaking events that occur, and you can just feel the emotion pouring out of them. I mean, it, it's pretty intense. Um, and, and it's just one of the things that I would like to see have happen would be like this uncredited walkthrough by one of the other SBT narrators who aren't listed um, from time to time. So like, you know, I, and I'm, I know Jeff Hayes is here, but just to have Jeff Hayes pop up and give like his blood curdling scream as someone's killed. And, and you go, that sounds like Jeff Hayes. What's he doing there? I'd love to see that. I think SBT has a lot of potential for that. And they've got a new guy and I'd like to acclimate to him and see what he's doing. Um, or even like have Annie make some monster noises. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like having Brad Pitt show up for three seconds in Deadpool 2. Um, it's unexpected and it's awesome. Um, but these two, they really work so well together. They play so well off each other. Um, it's a treat to listen to them. And, and I'm, I'm, I've listened to, um, the sound booth burlesque and just recently, cause I'm doing a, a naughty show coming up in a couple weeks and the sound booth burlesque <laughs> with Justin Thomas James and, and the burlesque ladies who I shall not name. Um, it, it, it's just, it just makes me think of how great the, the, these two here work together. Uh, you know, I, I am never disappointed by them. Uh, they are a great pair. They are a great pair and I'm always happy to have them, you know, narrate a book. I mean, Justin Thomas James is about as suave and as smooth as a mother. F Did somebody say shut up? As a mother loving goose ever should be. Um, and Annie, you know, not Annie, I'm sorry, forgive me, Lori. Uh, Lori just has this, this amazing voice, um, that just pulls you right in, uh, to her characters. And, and they both do like this, this great Scottish accent, uh, that just, <laughs> just, you know, you sit there and go, okay, this is like them doing dwarves because all dwarves are Scottish in fantasy, apparently. And, you know, it works. They, they, they work it out really well. And you can tell who's, who's talking no matter what character it is, even though basically it's just Justin Thomas James and, and Lori Catherine Winkle, um, you know which characters are saying what at any given moment, any given second. Um, there's never a question of who's doing what, even though they're the only two people really doing anything at all. Um, so like I say, it's a treat. This book is 8.6 stars out of the gate. It is rockingly good. So, you know, get out there, get that rock spider going, crank it up in the radio, you know, because everybody there was a drow. Um, get it. Get that, get that MP3 too. Um, I'll make that soon and get that out there for you. Um, but yeah, final score 8.6. I love this book. So the next book that I'm doing is an apocalyptic series is Towers of Heaven by Cameron Milan. Or Mylan. I don't know. I keep hearing it differently stated in a couple of different books. Milan, Mylan, you get the idea. Um, it's narrated by Steve Campbell, which is part of the series Towers of Heaven, book one, um, with a book length of seven hours and 37 minutes. Humanity stands at the brink of annihilation. Earth has been overrun by monsters, spawned by the six towers that appeared 80 years ago. Each tower pierces through the heavens. They are taller than any structure created by humankind and invulnerable to any attack. Demons run rampant through the cities, their infernal flames dying the planet red. Mount Everest is now the territory of a dragon, and the very oceans burn with hellfire. Earth has been transformed into an inhospitable landscape. There are no survivors. Except, of course, for the strongest of the ancestors— People who entered the tower long ago seeking riches and power. They are the strongest humanity has to offer, yet even they couldn't prevent the catastrophe. Now, I have been with Cameron Milan since he first released his Desire series. Uh, my biggest problem with him has always been that every single protagonist that he has 
is either instantly OP or rapidly becomes OP. I mean, overpowered, overpowered, overpowered. I mean, hell, the bad guy in Desire 2 was so OP that every time he got beaten, he popped up another power uh, that meant that he was even more indestructible than he was before. So they think they had this guy beat, and he'd be like, ha, 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 you thought you had me beat. But in reality, this was just me toying with you because I have the ability to do this, and pow. Then he, he's there. Um, and I just don't find that fun or exciting at all. I need to see struggle. That's why I think I fell asleep in the Captain Marvel movie. Um, Danvers was never in trouble. She was always stronger or a better fighter than whomever she faced. There was never any kind of, of butting of heads or conflicts. None of that stuff. I just, I, I remember I fell asleep three times. Three times I fell asleep in that movie because there was no conflict with the main character surviving or doing things. There's plenty of times if I watch the other movies and, and the Marvel thing, for example, where I think that I know that, you know, Captain America is not going to die. I know Thor is not going to die, but they are, are vulnerable. They're weakened. Um, that means that they are more humanized. Um, and, and here, Mylan or Milan, most of the time his characters, most of the time, are just like that. They're always OP. So, Milan puts out this book, right? <laughs> In which all but one human is destroyed. And he tries to resurrect the humans that were killed during the Tower Ocalypse. Now, I'll go into it, but basically, um, the towers spew forth monsters every so, so often. And there's, there's, Little things you can, there are little you can do because after a certain point, the monsters are just indestructible. They're just, they're, they're horrible, unstoppable killing monster, you know, machines. Um, but I'm going to backtrack a little bit and explain a little bit to you. So what happens is six mysterious towers just pop up over various countries of the world. Um, you know, so while separated spatially, you know, like one's in, 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 let's say one's in India and one's in the U.S., um, so that's the spatial difference. Um, they are connected. Each tower, all six towers or whatever it is, are connected to one another in these upper towers. So like, even though the one tower is in China and the ones in the U.S., if we all reach level 50 at the same time, we're all going into that tower level at the same time, even though we do it from different countries. But if I'm in the U.S. and I go into the first level here and I, I'm in China and I go into the first level... Never the two shall meet. They're very separated. The ones on the lower floors, the lower levels are designated specifically for the country they're in. And as you go up higher, then they become more unified for around the world. What you start off with at the book is you have a group of heroes who are the, the last survivors. And they're going in to beat this one monster um, in his, his final level. Um, and hopefully... Honestly, at this point, it's a suicide run. I think they all know they're all dead. No one's going to survive it because there's nobody left. There's literally nobody left outside. So it, technically, this is not an apocalypse book, but it really totally is. Like, there's no way, no place they ever say this was an apocalypse. But I'm including this here because when all of humanity is destroyed by some unstoppable event or thing, that's an apocalypse. Got it? So um, there are things that meet the apocalypse criteria and that's where I'm, I'm putting this book here but they go to the top floor and they're only the, they are the only people that have survived the entire world so they know that no matter what happens that's it this is the end of the world uh, and they do their best to stop and fight this this big monster at the end so by defining the final boss by defining the fighting defeating the final boss of the last floor, a hero is granted a wish. And so Jason the Cockroach, which is the, the MC, wishes to bring back all of the human race that was killed due to the events of the towers. And he's told he can't do that. So he, he wants to go back in time to stop that from happening. But they only send him back a short distance. It's not all the way back, like not to the very beginning of things. He's actually like 20 years into the event happening. So even that kind of falters 
a little bit. And I'm not trying to spoil anything. It, I mean, this happens pretty quickly in the book, and you'll see it. So it's it's not like this is like deep into the book. You'll be shocked and mad, and um, nothing I'm telling you is that that far in. It, it could be considered a spoiler. Um, but he goes back to avert the disasters, and he's not given the proper time to do it. <clears throat> so what he has to do is is um. He has to build himself up to be stronger than what he was originally. Now, the funny thing is, is that while I know other people, other people have found the MC to be overpowered, and I'm just to be frank with you, I know a lot of people have thought that Jason is overpowered. Not for Milan book. No, no. Uh, Cameron Milan, Cameron Milan, um, every character he ever has is more OP than the next. Uh, stand them side by side, first book, second book, third book, fourth book that he's written, they're going to get progressively stronger as you go, not the other way around. Um, so when people say that they're OP, I laugh because I actually found that Jason the Cockroach to be somewhat less juiced than I was expecting. Um, granted, he's strong, but compared to other Milan MCs, not so much. In fact, a lot of his, his success comes from the knowledge on how to beat monsters he's already fought. You know, remember, he's from the future, so he knows how to beat golems and dragons and zombies because he's fought them a million times. Like, you know, he said, I've been through this tower more times than I can count, more times than I'll ever be able to say. And so he's got this in-depth knowledge of every floor, every level, and it helps him. It helps him because... He, he can apply the knowledge from the future. He can apply the knowledge from the future into his fights of the now. And that's exactly what he does. Um, and he, he really does well because he's, even though his body is not the way it was, um, he still knows his moves. He's got that muscle memory down. So he can do things uh, that he wouldn't have been able to do if he had just came in off the street and said, hey, I'm going to try this. Um, but, you know, I'm going to say that he's he's not as powerful as other Milan MCs. In fact, a lot of his success is just that knowledge. Um, but he does get stronger, but not like in this exponential kind of way like I thought he would. You know, I was expecting him to be like, okay, now I'm two times stronger. And I picked up a bull every single day for a week, and now I'm ten times stronger. It's not this exponential growth that just keeps going bigger and bigger. And, and they get stronger. Um, to me... Um, He's actually pretty toned down for a Cameron Milan book. I mean, really toned down. Um, and that was nice. It was, for me, it was nice. Um, now this isn't to say that, that in any way, shape, or form that the book is perfect. Uh, the book does have flaws, but nothing that I couldn't overlook. And there were a few sections that I felt dragged a bit, like when EMC became a golem. Uh, but they weren't bad bits of writing. And I have to say this. Um, this is probably the best book that Mylan has written yet. Um, I just hope that he actually continues the series um, because he does have a tendency to just jump from one book to another with no follow-up afterwards. Um, the only one I know of for a fact that he's got two books out in is the Desire series. Um, that's the exception. Uh, but other than that, like he's got you know several other books that have come out that could have series behind them, but they don't have the series books, you know, and he's written other things. So he, he moved on from this to this, to this, to this, to this, to the next thing. And so you don't have like anything more than like the primer books, the first books of a series showing up. So it's kind of like, I hope that this continues because this was a good story. Um, <clears throat> I just hope, just really hope that, you know, because he has that tendency to jump, that he'll continue. Um, and, and of all the books he's done, Desire, it was, eh, I, you know, I could have lived with it or without it, but I could have lived without it more than I did live with it. And another issue that I found that I had in the book was the way Jason takes Roy under his wing. And because all of a sudden it goes from, I have to become this ultra powerful uh, man in order to stop the demon early. I'm giving myself like a five year plan here um, to, I have to train Roy. All we needed was a montage scene. That was it. And then we would have been fine, but it just kind of goes on to, you know, training, training, training. And then they bring in a girl that wants to have training as well. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's disconcerting to a certain point. 
Um, because, um, you need it to be, we're in a hurry to get this done. And instead you get, I'm in a hurry to help this other guy get leveled up and he's my protege. So, you know, I don't know. We, it just, it's one of those things we, we did, we needed the montage scene, but we didn't. We just needed to just say, here, here's what he's going to do. He's come out and he's going to, he's going to group with me and we're going to find things and fight things together until we're both leveled up. That's all the harder it had to be. Uh, now to be clear, this is not the second coming in book form, but I was really impressed with Mylan's growth and development here, especially in his writing. Um, I enjoyed the book and felt that it had decent fight scenes. Um, several characters kept my interest. One thing that threw me off was how so many levels were either skipped in the tower or provided no danger to the characters whatsoever. Now, there is enough leveling and class building to satisfy this and call this a lit RPG, but um, it's, it's one of those on-the-cusp things for me. I mean, I could say it is or it isn't, um, but there, there's there's leveling there and things like that, so I'm going to count that. Uh, Steve Campbell has really slipped into the role of uh, Mylan's narrator. Uh, I think that it is a good thing. I think Campbell's style and voice um, elevates the stories, and it's very clear that he shares Mylan's vision, and the pair mesh really well. Um, I look forward to more from him in the future. I'm going to say 7.9 stars um, just because of, of things that happened earlier on. Um, like we talked about, you know, um, so you know, we don't need the, 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 the protege thing. We don't need that at all. Uh, I, I don't know why it's there, but yeah. So just, just so you know, 7.9 stars. Um, but otherwise the story is really good and I don't think you should just skip it just because it's a seven point whatever. Uh, I really debated on how much to give it. I was originally at like 7.6, but then I thought, no, I, I enjoyed this book. I think it's a it's a good book, um, and, and so I went from there. Um, so seven point nine stars. Okay, my next book is Arcane Kingdom Online: The Chosen, a lit RPG adventure series, book one. This is by Jacob Tanner, narrated by Ryan Burke, and uh, it's got a six hour and seven minute length. Humanity stands at the brink of annihilation. Earth has been overrun by monsters, spawned by the six towers that appeared 80 years ago. Each tower pierces through the heavens. They are taller than any structure created by humankind and invulnerable to any attack. Demons run rampant through the cities, their infernal flames dyeing the planet red. Mount Everest is now the territory of a dragon, and the very oceans burn with hellfire. Earth has been transformed into an inhospitable landscape. There are no survivors. Except, of course, for the strongest of the ancestors. People who entered the tower long ago seeking riches and power. They are the strongest humanity has to offer, yet even they couldn't prevent the catastrophe. So, Arcane Kingdom... Um has the world ending due to something called a zero virus. Uh, it's where you have this long incubation period. Uh, and then when you go viral where you're infectious, it takes you several more days to, to die. And it's a really slow, horrible death. Now the main character of the, the book, um, it starts off pretty quickly, ends up revealing, um, quite by accident that he has the zero virus. He's discovered by having it after he leaves a plane. Um, and he is taken away and just tossed into a room full of dead bodies and corpses, uh, and is just left there. They just ignore him. And uh, pretty much he is just there to die. That's it. He just kind of realizes this is it. He's done. Um, his life is over and he's going to die this horrible, painful death all alone amongst a bunch of corpses. He's not happy. He's very, very, not happy. Let's just, you understand why. Well, it turns out, um, he's pulled from that room and taken to another facility because he has connections. Um, he's got a, a brother who's his big shot, uh, that will allow him to have his brain downloaded into a game. Um, now to be honest, this is nothing you haven't heard or seen a dozen times over, you know, where something goes wrong and then you've got to download somebody into the game in order to survive. But, it's, it's a decent story so far. 
And on the other side, the writing itself is actually well done and it's pretty solid. Now, I, I really cannot speak for what happens in the written books. Like, I don't see the ebooks. So if there's spelling errors or sentence grammatical structure errors or something like that, I never see it. There's a couple that I do catch uh, periodically um, due to uh, just the way things are worded or spoken about. Um, you know, I have one book that I just listened to, and you could tell that, you know, it, the writer wrote like he talked. And it, it wasn't all that bad, but there were points where you'd be like, that's just not the right way that this should have been said. And I don't have that issue here. So I know that, you know, um, Tanner has some chops, but it just feels like he's hitting the audience with one of the Kung Fu chops as if he were Hong Kong Fui. Um, if you know Hong Kong Fui, you don't have to worry about his Kung Fu chops. They're just not that great. Um, the book is all right, but that's, that's really all it is. It's, it's all right. It lacks a wow factor. Um, I needed something to go big, uh, and, and it, but it does kind of go big at the end. It does kind of say, here's what happens. Um, but I don't know if it was enough for me to say, um, this was a fantastic book or this, this book drew me in. Um, it does a lot of good things, but they're not enough to make me say this is different from everything else I've read. Um, it, it does stand out to, to certain things. Like I remember the zero virus very distinctly and him having it and things like that. But the in game mechanics and, and, and the gaming stuff, I think all that got overshadowed because of the narration. Now the narrator Burke, he's not bad. He's not bad, but the low point is the narration because for some reason he just does not know how to use gaming terms simple things like hud like you know your heads up display um he wouldn't pronounce it hud he would pronounce it the hud um every single time so if any time there was some sort of acronym like you know wh whatever it would be if there was an acronym he would literally say the the, the letters rather than what it means so if you had xp instead of saying experience points he would say xp which most times that's great but you get the like hp he would you know say hit point he wouldn't say hit points he would say hp um so if you had stam he, he would say stam not stamina whatever it was uh th th you can just clearly tell he has no idea what he's talking about um and, and to me that's like a, a massive faux pas that, that that is like one of those things that um if I was the author, I would have to listen and say, look, 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 back it up, Jack. Um, you you got to go back and redo this because this does not sound right. This is not how it's done. It's not how it's said. Go back and, and use the word like attack power. Go back and use the word HUD. That's why it's written like that. I don't have it spaced out. I don't have it this way. It, it's written just like it is. Just say it like it is. If you don't understand the word or what it should be, ask me. I'll tell you. But, but we didn't get that. And I don't know if this is because, like, um, Jacob Tanner went to somebody to do this book for him audibly, and they just gave him, you know, Burke and, and, and said, there you go, Burke, go do what you got to do, which that happens. I know, like, you know, and again, I'm not pointing fingers, but, like, um, Podium, I, I know if you sign with them, you don't really get to pick your narrator. It's just you're assigned a narrator and you get the luck of the draw. Uh, either it's great or it sucks or it's mediocre, but either way, you have no say in it. And I don't know if that was the case here, but I know that if it was me, I would have listened to the book uh, a couple of times and said, look, um, 48 minutes into this, you're, you're saying like craziness, craziness. Like, for example, I'll just give you one. I, I didn't do it in the review itself, but I'm going to just say it now. Like in, in the, the tower book, um, Steve Campbell repeats chapter 11 twice. He goes, chapter 11, chapter 11. And that's the only glitch or snafu I had in the entire book. Um, and I'm not trying to beat Steve up, but it, it just kind of was like, I was like, wow, he's, he's, he repeats that twice just, just because. Um, but he, otherwise he's perfect. He's, he's a good narrator. Um, he, he just nails everything here. I, I can't say like, wow, Burke just, just, blew me away. This was amazing. Um, everything he did was right, except for this little bit. It was kind of like the narrator, and I'm, I'm going to go way back to uh, Nova Core Online or Nova Online, um, where in, in the book, the words ensign was repeatedly stated as ensigns. Um, that made me insane. Made me insane. And it's the same thing here. The, the, the longer you go through the book, you'll see like things like that happen. Um, 
where instead of saying like you know like you like you say hud you get the hud and it, it just distracts you and to me it just takes you right out of the moment you, you don't get to experience anything like you should because you're going did he just say hud instead of hud or heads up display i mean why would he do that um and that happens throughout the book so burke lost me a few times and just completely pulled me right out of the story now it wasn't intentional but he sure as hell did it. And, and to me, I need to stay in. You know, I can suspend my disbelief for just about anything. I have that power because I, I, I've been like a, a reader uh, since I was a kid. I've been watching movies and TV since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Um, so I can sit down and say, this is really happening whenever I read or watch something or listen to it. Um, I, like old time radio shows. I love those things. I can close my eyes and see the things happening. Um, but when you have like these, these hiccups, it just totally tears me out of it. And it's hard for me to go back in. Whereas before when it starts, dun, 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 okay, I'm into it. Um, now I've got to try to get back into this. That's already in progress. And that, that's not easy to do. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the good of it is, is the writing's not bad that I could tell. Uh, the story's good. The, 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 the story has, has some, some points to it. I mean, like I say, it's nothing major, but the, the, the the characterizations are pretty good, and so on and so forth. So you you know the, the story is not what lacks. What really is killing me with this is the narration throughout. Um, and like I say, the story starts with the, the zero virus. The MC gets it, goes into the game world, and the problem he has in the game world is is there's a lot of glitches going on for for some bizarre reason. There are glitches out to yin yang. Um, and he's also not guaranteed to exist. There's like a period, I don't want to call it a cool down period, but you load in and then you've got like a couple of days before you're guaranteed to be 100% in. He's only given like a 65% chance of surviving. So, um, no one wants to get really close to him until they know for a fact that he's going to be sticking around forever. Um, because there's the glitches and things like that, but it's also, you've got, you know, You've got like a, a crapshoot as to whether you're going to make it. Now, he, he manages to acquire some bizarre tattoo or mark or whatever you want to call it. And it, it, it's got like a lot of significance. Um, and it, it, it gets used and its use flips everybody out because it's not supposed to be used. The, the, the mark has some magical powers, um, and there's reasons for what it does and why it does what it does that I don't want to get into because it would be very spoilery, and I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. Um, but just suffice to say that um, the, the whole point to the glitching stuff is tied into the black mark or the dark mark. So there's, there's that going on to it. Um, now... <clears throat> Um, it does seem to me that there were a, a couple other issues that we need to discuss. And, and one is the repeated character sheets. Like it just seems like the, the character sheets rolled on and on and on for no reason other than that they, you know, they needed to fulfill a word count. Uh, because it was just like, I, we just did, we just did the, 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 the character sheet. Why are we doing it again? Why is this happening now uh, after all this time? And I, and I don't know. I mean, that's just that's just the way things go. It, it just shows you that he, he he really had no clue other than to, I need to put up stats right away. I have to have stats up because this is a lit RPG book, so I've got to have stats up. Or like I said, he had to fill in, you know, for word count, so he would just go back and put in all this stuff. But it, to me, it, it just it shouldn't have been that way. Um, he should have trimmed it back or just shown what was changed or put the, like, like I know how Charles Dean does it now and other people are starting to emulate this. Put the stat sheets, the character sheets at the end of each chapter so that, that, you know, if you want to skip it, you can. Now, I don't because I don't skip stuff. But if you want to, that's fantastic. And that's how I would do it. I would put it, put it in these little, little bike racks where you, you can just kind of, Park that over there and leave it be and come back to it if you need to. Um, but, but that's just it. it. You know, leave it like at the end of the page, or at the end of the chapter, I should say, and let it go. There's no reason to, you know, interject it every 10 minutes or every five minutes um, of the readings. So I don't know. Anyway, um, a positive for me 
is that um, the book does have a lot of gore to it. Um, I don't want to say it's overly gory, but there is gore there. Uh, and it has horror elements. You know, there's there's the zero virus and what happens with the virus afterwards. So if you like darker stuff, um, and especially in, in the game itself, there's like a, a, a the glitches start causing this these weird monster things to kill people. Um, and it's not like nicely done. It's pretty gross and nasty and graphic. Um, but but. Yeah, if you like horror, this is this is the book for you. I mean, you'll you'll enjoy this. Um, now, this does qualify as an apocalypse book. I'm going to say that one last time. I don't want to give too much away, so just take my word for it. Um, and I know this is going to be a short review, um, but this book had some problems. It's not bad, but it did have some problems. I will listen to the next book when it hits Audible. I want to see what comes next. Um, and then if if the issues that were here kind of persist, like I'm not doing, you know, 14 character sheets inside of 25 minutes and i'm not going to sit and listen to somebody say the word hud 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 you know as h-u-d you know my i-u-d has an i-e-d and my h-u-d is useless in the situation I don't know. I mean, IEPs, I, I don't even know. There's so many acronyms out there, but, but that, that's the point I'm making is that just that, that comes up so much. And I just don't know if I can do it again if it continues in the second book to the degree it did here. But I will get the second book and I'll let you know. And probably if I weren't so tired, it's now 2 a.m., I'd probably go into this a little bit more and probably be a little bit more ranty. Um, but I'm trying to be quiet and I'm trying to just get myself to, you know, to focus and say what, what's on here. Um, so I don't want to go too overboard. Um, but, but that's just the way the book is. I, I, I did enjoy the book in spite of its flaws. There was a lot of stuff that I enjoyed that, that really stood out, but it's really not anything you haven't seen before or heard before. So if you're just looking for a quick, you know, like, uh, I call it a pulp magazine or a pulp um, dime store novel or something this this is pretty good um it, it'll, it'll fulfill your your lit rpg needs but it's not going to swamp you or take you away with what what you're getting it, it, it's it's pretty good for that sort of thing it's just it's just a throwaway kind of novel um and that, that's just the best way i can put it um, it's good enough to read i don't know that you're going to want to reread it in two weeks or two months or two years i could be wrong um, but that's just the way I looked at it. Final score, seven stars. I'm being a little bit generous um, because uh, there's nothing wrong that I can see with the story. Um, but, you know, again, th- this is just one of those things where um, uh, I'm trying to be fair about things. But I-, I could probably go a little bit lower on this one. But seven stars. Next up, The Great Filter. A post-apocalyptic game-lit novel, which is part of the Great Filter series, book one, um, written by Russell Wilboninsky, uh, narrated by Neil Helligers, with a book length of eight hours and 15 minutes. Filled with pasta noodles, everything. Rain hung in the sky. Birds hovering mid-flight, wings still as statues. It was like someone had hit pause in the world. Honestly, that's exactly what happened. Billions of humans, young and old, received the same message. A message staggering in its implications. It wasn't a radio broadcast or a television cutscene. This message appeared in the minds of every human on Earth. A glowing screen projected in midair like those augmented reality goggles that were growing in popularity. It didn't matter who you were, what you did, or what you believed. The message on the screen changed everything. Maybe even more than the missiles. Greetings, humanity. This is the 1,380,650th time your species simulation has failed to surpass the Great Filter. So, here is a book that I simultaneously enjoyed and got really pissed off about at the same time. Now, I, this is the one I said, okay, um, I have very few rules when it comes to enjoying a book. Um, for example, if a book is good, and it is it is good regardless of whether it's a right-to-market novel, right novel or not, um, 
if it isn't rate to novel, uh, rate to market, then great. I, I enjoy that too. But I'll point out that this is rate to market book, but it's fantastic. And that's, that's all that matters is if you get a good story. Um, so I just want to point out if a story's good, I let it stand on its own merits. However, there are one or two things you can do in a story that will earn my M M M and M and M and T and M and T enemy enmity enmity. That's the way you say it. And Will Banowski pulls off one of the big ones. Okay. And all I'm going to say is, is that the book should have been written with a shift from POV from one to another. Uh, and it, and that isn't a major cheat, okay? I completely felt ripped off, um, and, and my trust was shattered by the way that this was done. There are unreliable narrators, and then there's what's happened in this book. Um, the book should have gone from like third person to first or first person to third. Either way, at some point, there should have been a transition um, because of what happens in the book. It's a necessary thing. Um, and I'm going to say it just, just like this. It's, it's necessary for a couple of reasons. One, because it's the right thing to do. Um, two, um, I, I don't think that the narrator could have handled the switch as well. Um, one way or the other. I think, well, no, it, he could have, um, but it, it couldn't have been first person at the end. It, it had to be for third person POV at the end. Um, and even then, um, there's a lot of female voices and he doesn't do female voices quite as well as others do. And it just, it wouldn't have played off as well. So anyway, anyway, I was telling you right up front that I've taken a full point off of the book for these shenanigans. Um, and I really enjoyed this book. That's the bad thing. Up until a certain point, I was digging this book hard. Um, the story had some real merits. Um, and it did things I had not seen before. In this tale, um, you come to find out that all of humanity and our world is nothing more than a digital construct uh, that was run to, used to run simulations about our worthiness, like what we would do in situations and things like that. So like as Elon Musk says, we're living in a digitized world like the Matrix. This story takes that concept, that idea, and says, yep, that's exactly what it is. Um, but we've let the dev developers down. We, we just, we suck so hard. They're like, you know what? Pull the plug on the project. We don't need it anymore. We, we just kill it. Um, and then somebody says, well, hey, rather than killing the project, why don't we apocalypse the hell out of these people? We'll bomb them into, you know, a nuclear winter for a hundred years. Um, and then we'll have mutants and monsters and zombies show up. Um, and, and that's exactly what they do. That's exactly it. So it turns out because we really suck, we just get blown up. Um, and then have to go through this ringer of horrible, horrible things every single day. Um, now the, the, the survivors, and I guess it's kind of random because there was no really reason given for, stating who survived and why and the why was never stated like i survived because i was in an underground bunker like i'm currently in right now i'm in my underground bunker and i'm safe from the apocalypse outside um they don't say that here it's just kind of like random people um survived and then they're tested to see like where they they match up at you know skill wise for surviving the apocalypse and that's it i mean that's just all there is to it um but yeah, you know, you, you got to struggle to stay alive and, and, and you got to find food. So that's the apocalyptic part. Um, the game mechanics work pretty well, pretty well. Um, the story is fairly fun. It's interesting. The story has nice humorous parts, has well developed characters, um, and deals out action like it was like in a Jason Statham versus Arnold Schwarzenegger flick. Um, the MC is engaging and interesting. Um, and best of all, all the characters are for the most part, intelligent intelligent people and they feel logical and real but the intelligent part is the biggest thing for me because you don't feel like they're doing stupid things every five minutes you feel like these people are thinking about what they're doing why they're doing it what the impact of what they're doing is going to be and what they should do to correct the impact if something does go wrong. And that's like that throughout the entire book with each character. There's a reason why these people have survived. And that's it. That, that's, that's the whole point to this new changeover is to see 
how long they survive and what they can do to survive and, and you know why they want to survive because it doesn't seem like it's a very good place to to exist um now the narration by Helligers, um, it works right up again, like I say, to the last chapter. And then for no fault of his own, it doesn't fit. Um, we, we do have a different character give up their interpretation of what happens at the end of the book compared to the main MC. Um, and, and the voice and the tone doesn't match up with that switch. Um, his voice, for example, is, is, is great for a grizzled veteran who's like smoked a pack a day or drinks a lot. But in other words, you know, in other words, it's deep and it's dangerous sounding. Um, you know, uh, we we watched the explosion from the street, and many people died. I saw a man decapitated as a hubcap flew by. That is his style. But if he has a ten year old girl tell you the same exact thing, it just doesn't work. You know, he, he doesn't pull off the 10 year old girl as well as he does the grizzled old guy that's been drinking for 40 years. Um, you know, she tells her side of things and it doesn't really match up. Um, and like I said, if it had been switched over to third person, third person would have eliminated a whole lot of issues, a whole lot of issues. Um, rather than being totally the same as the first part. You know, so on and so forth, being told in first person. It was just very un unsettling and disjointed uh, to do it like that. It should have been delineated right down the line. Pow, this is where this happens. This is where that happens. And never in the center shall they meet. However, they do. Um, now, it makes me really sad because this could have been an eight-star book. Really could have. Um, it hits all the check marks of what a good story needs. But the flip, the flip at the end, and this is where I'm going to say... Um, this is new Ray. I have a new lease on life. I'm trying to be very positive and not flip out or snap over stuff. And, and really, it's not worth snapping. But the, the flip at the end just really hosed me down. I was more happy with the flip at the end. Um, and I usually would go off on this and ramble and rant for a little while. But I'm going to stay calm on this. Stay very calm. Um, but I look at it like this, okay? Think of it like um, if the story was being told by someone, and then that someone should be able to tell the tale. Um, they should be able to be the people. They should be the person telling the story. And I always think of that original Alien film. And in it, Sigourney Weaver was supposed to narrate over what happens in the story. If you've watched Alien, you know there's no narration. There's no person telling you, like, and then we went to the lab and this is what happened. But they were supposed to have that. That was supposed to be there. Um, and at the end of the film, you were supposed to see that Sigourney Weaver's character, Ripley, was dead. And it was the alien talking to Mother, the computer, um, and, and detailing the story of what happened on the ship. And if it had happened, th then, you know, you, you would have just said, this is a total scam, it's a total ripoff. Um, if they had done that, then we would not have had the 37 alien movies that are out today. I mean, after seeing Alien 3, I kind of wish that they had done that. Um, well, I mean, eh, I mean, aliens, you know, part two, uh, that really overrides anything negative that three or four, or any of the other crap that came out after it did. Cause aliens is the bomb. You know, Hicks is bomb. Um, is that right? Is that right terminology for you kids? I don't remember. What the hell? It's the end of the world. I don't care what the kids talk about anymore. They're not talking much. Um, but it, it just goes back to, um, me like, okay, like if you've ever seen Fallen with Denzel Washington, there's a narrator and he's telling a story, but at the end of the story, you find out the narrator is a cat. Now, I don't want to go into more detail than that, but it's not who you thought it was. And, you know, if you watch it, it's a little bit more to it than it being a cat, but it's a cat. Okay. I don't want to ruin it. No, no spoiler, but it's been out for 20 years. I can tell you this story. Um, so there's a rug that gets pulled out from under you that you're standing on and, and it's just not fun. You know, it's not only is there a rug being pulled out from underneath you, there is a trap door, you know, and then the trap door leads to a pit and the pit is filled with spikes and molten lava. It's, it just is very disturbing how that happens. Now, I'm going to be frank with you. If the one twist had not happened, fantastic book. And I am all for what happens that causes the narration switch. You know, there, there's a point where two different people are talking. 
I'm all for it because I think that that has to happen. There has to be a reason. There has to be a purpose. It has to do something. And it worked. And if they'd stopped right there, they'd have had it. It'd have been a perfect book. But they didn't. They picked up and they added some sort of epilogue type chapter at the end. And it totally blew it. Totally blew it. Um, so, you know, what could have been a really good book is it, it, really went down for me just a little bit. Now, again, I'm going to say the book is good. The characters are amazing. Um, the, the, the system itself is well thought out. I enjoyed the book all the way up until the end. And it's one of my pet peeves. So I, I'm probably going to get more pissed off over it than you will. But you may get mad. I don't know. But for now, I'm just going to say seven stars and leave it at that. Oh, man. This is really one hell of a show. I mean, I get to, to really review some amazing books. Um, the next book I'm doing is Viridian Gate Online Doom Forge, which is part of the Viridian Gate archives. This is book six. I think we have two books left in this series. It makes me very sad to say that um, because this is just an incredible series. Um, it's amazing, and it's so well done and performed, and, and I just hate to see it end. Um, this is written by James Hunter, narrated by Armin Taylor. Uh, like I say, this is the Viridian Gate Archives, so keep that in mind that there are more books out there. This is book six, uh, and with a book length of 14 hours and eight minutes. I inched forward on my belly, the snow crunching softly beneath my wiggling body, then stopped at the edge of the rolling hillock. Nestled in the valley below was our target, Gloam Cory. Slowly, carefully, I lifted the bronze spyglass to my eye breathing out a wispy cloud of steam, which immediately fogged the lens. I grunted, adjusted my position, and wiped the lens clean with one thumb. I slipped the spy scope back into place. Much better. It was deep night, but the moon overhead was full and brilliant, casting silvered light over the city of Spires. Gloam Cory was a dark, brooding place, a hard city much like the frozen wastes surrounding it and the Reesey who called it home. So I can totally say, without any kind of a bias, this is unquestionably the best VGO novel to date after the first book. And the reason why I say that is because the first book had to hook you. It had to bring you in. It had to be amazing for you to care about another five books thereafter. But this book, my God, it packs in a hell of a lot of material and continues to advance the storyline at the same time. And that is a problem with a whole lot of series. In order to keep a set of books alive, the series kind of treads water and goes nowhere fast. Um, the whole point to a series is to complete a large overarching storyline that can't be done in one or three books. Um, as much as it pains me, I'm going to use one of my least least favorite um, series to illustrate this point. And when I say least favorite, I mean, I just can't talk about it without wanting to cry. But anyway, Harry Potter. And yes, I have read every Harry Potter word, line for line, word for word, in every single book, from one to the last, from start to scratch start to finish, whatever it is. Um, I have done that because my kids loved the stories and I would read to them and do the voices and things like that. Um, and so I know that as, as yeah, you know what? There, there's a lot of things wrong with Harry Potter. I mean, there are plot holes the size of buses. Uh, it's got some weak transitions. Um, but the overall story that's told, it is told. Um, and we don't need, you know, the epilogue at the end just was, it was a thrown in there, but there's this overarching tale of Harry versus Voldemort that takes eight books or whatever it was to get through and get told. Now, yeah, there's a lot of things that could have happened otherwise that we could have trimmed that down to four books or whatever. But the point is, is that all the books do what they're supposed to do and they take you to where you need to be story wise. It's, it's a cohesive singular plot over a series of time. And that's important. You know, um, because you just don't get that very often. Um, now, Hunter keeps things on course really well and wisely, very wisely in this case, he keeps Osmark out of the way in this novel. You know, like, for example, Lex Luthor does not need to be in every single Superman comic, 
nor does Aura Osmark belong in each VGO iteration. There's just some things that you can say, we don't need him here. And in fact, his absence made him more present than I think that it would have been if he had just shown up for one or two, you know, paragraphs in a chapter or something along those lines. Now, there was one thing that, uh, that did repeat, um, from earlier books. And I just want to touch on this for a second. And it was the use of the Death Heads quest for a second time. Now, my biggest contention is that this is something that should have been done as a one-time deal or for use by other characters in the side quest novels or whatever, or even Cutter, and maybe have them fail it just to see what happens. Um, because it's set up to be this really impossible challenge. It's, it's really unbelievable. You've got to climb every mountain and get into space somehow when you don't have enough oomph to get up there um, on your own. And you've got to survive being attacked by 18,000 different predators and monsters and things like that. It's, it's really hard. It's, it's meant to be impossible, almost impossible, but they apparently they're not that impossible because, because Jack has beaten, you know, one and he's getting another. So, you know, a, a death said quest should be all but impossible to survive and should not only, you know, display incredible skills, but also show that you have intensive luck. Um, you know, completing two Death's Heads, and I'm not saying he does it, um, Quest pushes the boundaries a wee bit and takes away from, like, the first achievement of having some incredible skill. Um, I just wish some other plot device had been used. Um, I know that, you know, you have to have some sort of conflict to make things dangerous and, and that sort of thing, um, but it just does not carry the same impact or the same shock as it did the first time around. This is this was kind of like um, using the same weapon um, in two different movies. You know, I mean, like, let me just say, you know, um, for example, uh, Luke Skywalker has the Jedi Knight lightsaber, and he is fighting Darth Vader, and it's great the first time, but after you've watched 14,000 Jedi's, I don't want to call it a sword fight, but, you know, saber fighting um, each other, it, it loses its impact. You know, it was really cool when it first happened, but the more it happens, the, the less powerful it becomes. And, and that's probably a bad example, but, but you get my point, right? I mean, it, the Death's Head quest should have been in check. It, it should have been like, I'm going to pull this out. Only in case of an emergency, like break the glass, only in case of the emergency, so we can get like a really good quest or have some other dramatic thing happen um, in order for us to, you know, survive and complete this. And eh, we didn't really get that. Um, you know, it's just like you say, completing two is just pushing the boundaries of believability. Um, I don't know. That's just the way I feel about it. Other than that, the book is really refreshing. I, I don't know what to gush about first. I really don't. Um, the new gear, the new races, the ability that Jack gets. I mean, you can see there's a metric crapload of amazingness in this book. Um, if the first book didn't set the bar so high, like I said, I would say hands down, this is the best book in the series. And it really is. It's really good. It's incredible. It's intense. It's, it's, it's very fresh feeling. Very fresh. Even though, even though, it is uh, one of those things where um, we have that Death's Head quest pop up for a second time. It still feels fresh. So I don't know. Um, it's just the way it looks. Uh, you know, uh, if, if the first book didn't set the book so high, I don't know. I, I might have different thoughts, but this one, this one's really right there. It's right there. It's pushing it, and it's amazing. Um, it resounds. It, I mean, the book resounds with crunch to keep the gamers happy, and it's still smooth and flows like a river for the fantasy fiends like myself. Um, you know, not that I don't like the, the crunchiness of lit, but I'm more of a get into the story kind of guy rather than jump, jump out. Um, and this series is one of the reasons that I read lit RPG. It sucked me in, it pulled me under. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, this book is a riptide, the series. This book in particular, man, it is incredibly powerful. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't come up for air. I just, I, I couldn't. I, there was just not once after I started this book that I come up for air. I just could not. Um, 
so that should say something. I, you know, I am digging, and I'm also digging Cutter's poofing out of thin air ability. It's really neat to see him doing this um, and seeing others growing in power as well. But I was happy that Jack was the focus, the main focus of this book. Um, you know, he, he carries this story, and we could have had a story solely about him on his own doing things, and it would have been just as good. Um, like I say, Hunter could keep, you know, keep us going for another 10 years with the way he's writing. Um, but thankfully, he wants to conclude the series, and I agree with that 100%, um, conclude the series pretty soon. And then if he wants to, he can open up more more side quest books, um, you know, or open up anthologies for other, you know, revisitations of the world. He could even do a, a short collection of short stories, you know, for himself, um, uh, set in VGO. Um, even though that the, the, the series ends at book eight, it doesn't mean that that's it. There are a lot of other people out there writing stories right now for them. And those stories will carry over. So, you know, even though one part of the story is going to be finished, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get more. <clears throat> but in this case, Jack really carries this book. I mean, he really carries it. Armin Taylor is always, always amazing. Uh, he is the voice of VGO. Um, and the first person that I think of after Hunter, when I'm thinking about Viridian Gate. So while James crafts one hell of a story, it's Armin who steals the show. It's really not really fair at all. Um, I almost feel bad for James because Taylor gets to live out all the characters and give us his interpretation of what they are like. So um, you get to kind of see exactly how great these two mesh up because, like I say, Taylor totally totally um takes this and runs with it i mean he is he is downfield and is, is crossing the, the goal line and, and spiking the ball before anybody else even knows what's happened um that's how good he is with this i mean he is really amazing and i enjoyed it a lot um and i know you will too my final scar my final scar i hope this is my final scar is 8.5 star, stars. Score scar. He's not freaking. Sorry, I had to go back in time. Um, the amazing stars. What was I talking about? Anyway, final score is the 8.5 stars. Uh, it was just a really good story, and I just I can't get enough of it. Can't wait to see what happens next. Well, my pretty babies, uh, I think I've made it to the end of the show here. I'm not sure how much longer I can make it. I hope you all can hold out during this apocalypse. It's pretty bad outside. I know you can't hear it because I'm in my bunker, um, but there are, are uh, sirens. There's a lot of gunfire going off. There's people screaming. Um, and I'm going to uh, lock my hatch so that no bad stuff can happen. All I know is, uh, is that you should never go outside. Stay indoors. Just don't go outside. With that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching. I hope you've really enjoyed the show. It was fun doing an apocalypse show. Uh, I thought about doing this for a while, and I have finally had all enough books come together I could do this. Um, so remember, if you like the episode, if you do enjoyed this, uh, please like and share. Comment in the section below. I appreciate getting your feedback. Remember, you can always follow us. On Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. So no reason to miss us if we were out there. And I know I've been going for a while, so I try to make up for it a little bit with this show, which is a little bit longer. You'll see I've got quite a few reviews here, uh, quite a few number of books, uh, and I, I think that they were all pretty good choices uh, for this apocalypse. So, you know, with having nothing but time to kill left now, you know, uh, this is the time to get your audio in before the internet goes down. Because when that interweb thing disappears, you're stuck. You're stuck. So get all the electronic stuff you can. I hope you have a really good generator, lots of fuel, lots of food stacked up um, to get you through this. And when it's all said and done with, we got to go out and repopulate the world. Don't forget that, pretty babies. Don't forget that. So as always, again, thank you for coming, for listening. I Did you hear that? Did it pick up on the mic? It's really bizarre. It sounded like somebody said, come outside. Uh, well, I'm not going to go. 
Well, there it was again. I know you had to have picked that up. I mean, this isn't like EVP mic or anything, so if you hear something, there has to be something there. But that means there's somebody in my bunker. Well, I can't have that. I've got to go. I'll be right back. All right? You folks take care. Get, prepare for the end. It's coming. And, and make sure you stay indoors at all times. I was wrong. It's safe outside. Go out and enjoy the sun. Go outside.